Good morning, Calvary. I greet you in Christ's name, in the name of Jesus. God is good. All the time, God is good. God is awesome. God is an awesome God. Raise your hands if, if God is good. Raise your hands. I, I, I bear testimony to that. I hope you have that as well in your life. Today's sermon is titled, What Happened to the Sign Gifts? It's the second in a series of messages relating to spiritual gifts in the body of Christ. Our text today is 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 13. I'd invite you to open your Bibles to that passage. We'll be reading that in a few moments. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 13. There are three classifications, or there can be three classifications of spiritual gifts. Um, I have got them here, and this is not original with me, uh, list in three classifications. The first one is sign gifts, over on the left of your screen there. There are speaking gifts, and there are service gifts. And uh, I have elected in this series of messages to treat those individually. Um, and today is the sign gifts. The sign gifts are, or were given primarily for a certain function and a certain time. They were given bear, to bear testimony to a new work that God was doing with his people to bear testimony to his people and his message so that people would believe. And there are a certain group of people that would disagree strongly with what I just said. Uh, there are people that uh, today feel that very much that the sign gifts are for today. And they're just as relevant today as they were back during the first century. That we should be speaking in tongues in our worship service and that we should have healing services where we claim healing for people, miraculous healing by laying on of hands or whatever means. I, two weeks ago, uh, yesterday, uh, we buried my mom down in Tennessee in a little graveyard, very cute little graveyard out in the country, a little community graveyard. And uh, mom and dad are both buried there side by side now. But over one plot over is my brother Noah's grave. My older brother Noah uh, died at 50-some years of age. Much too young. He shouldn't have died, I think. Um, but he is. He's there buried. Um, Noah loved the Lord. He was a, 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 a strong believer, I would say. Um, he was... Growing up there in Belize, he was the one that was out giving out tracts to people. He was the one that was interacting with the native people more than any of the rest of us. Noah got involved with the Pentecostal or charismatic movement. My brother Noah uh, married a Belizean girl from that church. And uh, they were very, very much a part of that charismatic movement. They moved up back up to the States uh, a while after they got married. And uh, they moved out to Oklahoma, Tulsa, Oklahoma, close to Oral Roberts University. And those of you who know what Oral Roberts stands for, there's very much a charismatic, faith-healing type of environment. And they were very much in that, that movement, if you will. Claim it, name it, claim it, health and wealth. Well, Noah had either one, neither one of those. Um, Noah got sick. Noah got cancer, a very vicious melanoma in his eye, of all places. And when he first went to see the doctor, which was probably a long time after he should have, the doctor said, you've got to have surgery immediately and remove that eye and, and get this cancer taken care of. Well, Noah believed because of his, his, his charismatic Pentecostal faith that you should name it and claim it, that you should pray and have this healing happen. And all, oh, believe me, they did. They named it and claimed it, but he just kept getting worse. 
And uh, it got so bad that we realized that Noah was not got going to make it. Noah's cancer spread from his eye up into his brain. And a group of us siblings, and I think a half a dozen of us, along with our mom, we went out to, to Tulsa and visited Noah a couple of times. Second time, uh, maybe it was the first time, we went out there and, and took Noah to see a health professional and convinced Noah, uh, told Noah that to have the health professional convince him that he was dying, that Noah was not going to live. And uh, he died. Noah died from this cancer. Um, and the day of his, to the day of his death, I wasn't there when he died. I preached his funeral message then. But I wasn't there when he died. But his widow, who is now his widow, Lorette, uh, she was claiming health for Noah. Up and down over top of Noah. He was dying. And she was claiming health. That this, Noah is not going to die. Noah is going to be healed. That's, that's what these folks do. The charismatic movement is, believe it or not, you may not realize it in this community, but it is growing in leaps and bounds over the world. The charismatic movement, especially in third world countries, in South, Central and South America and in Africa, various places, the charismatic movement is flourishing. It is growing. It is leaps and bounds. Modern charismatics claim that the sign gifts are very much in effect today. It's a sign that the Holy Spirit is indwelling us when we practice these gifts. And it seems almost a, te almost a test of our conversion experience that if we have been converted, then we will speak in tongues, for instance. And, uh, and if we have faith, it's going to happen. And I'm going to sound a little harsh, but 90% of it is fake. Are there some real healings taking place? Yeah, there, there probably are a few, but I, I'm here to tell you, and this is not just me. This, it, it, a lot of it is fake. A lot of it is just fake. The leaders of this faith healing movement are flying around in the private jets on the backs of these poor people. And I'm not knocking all Pentecostals. I have a good friend at work who is a Pentecostal. He, he attends Garber's, the uh, First Assembly of God, over here at Garber's Church Road. And he's a fine Christian man. Does God perform miracles today? How many of you believe that God performs miracles? He does. God absolutely performs miracles. Some of you have experienced it personally, that God has performed a miracle. It would not have happened to you. You were healed or something happened to you, and it was a miracle. Um, we pray for the sick according to James 5, under the command, and we anoint them with oil, according to James 5, and sometimes God heals them, sometimes he doesn't. But miracles do happen today, I'm here to tell you, they certainly are. But we do not claim healing, that it must happen when we lay our hands on people. We leave it in God's hands. God has a plan and sometimes God is there to walk through us, in, with us in the fire, and not to deliver us out of the fire. We believe that God's bigger concern, and this is the heart of the message today, God's bigger concern for us as a church today is that we be healed spiritually. That our spiritual well-being is there, that in fact we grow in spirit fruit, not spirit gifts. Yes, we do want spirit gifts, but the miraculous spirit gifts I'm going to share uh, probably are not here today anymore. We believe that God heals, but does he give these miraculous spiritual gifts out anymore? I would say no, and you're going to probably argue with me, and I don't care if you argue with me. I, I have... I have, I have worked and, and prayed and, and, and worked through this subject to, to some length. Um, we know that God cares about people and God does miracles. But does he actually give the gifts where someone has the gift of miracles 
and he can just go around and lay hands on people and they are healed. I'm going to say no. The primary work of God in our lives, and listen up, folks. The primary work of God in our lives as Christians is to make us more like Jesus. Can I hear an amen? The primary work of God in our lives today is, is to make us more like his son, to conform us to the image of his son, the Bible says. That's his primary work. Does he care about our physical ailments? He does. But he doesn't always, for the higher good, heal us of these, of these elements in our lives. And in our phys physical weakness, as even the Apostle Paul testified, in our physical weakness, sometimes God is there with a purpose. God is always there in a purpose. And he doesn't always heal us. I'm going to introduce a new term to most of you probably are not familiar with. It's called cessationism. And I subscribe to this, this view. And it's defined on gotquestions.org as cessationism is the view that the miracle gifts of tongues and healing have ceased, that the end of the apostolic age brought about a cessation of the miracles associated with that age. Most cessationists believe that while God can and still does perform miracles today, the Holy Spirit no longer uses individuals to perform miraculous signs. That's the, the doctrine of cessationism. And um, I would subscribe to that. What happened to the sign gifts? So open, you've got your Bibles open. We want to look at our text. Let's stand together as, as I read the text, please. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 8 to 13. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish things, ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. You may be seated. The main point, if you still have your Bibles open, look at verse 10. The main point in these three verses hinges on the word perfect, in verse 10. What does the word perfect mean? The word perfect, translated perfect here, could be translated a number of ways from the original. Um, what is the context that often demands in which way it is translated? The best meaning for the word used here is mature. When that which is mature has come, then that which is less than that is done away. In this verse, the word mature seems to have to do with the completion of the scriptural canon and the foundation of the apostles and prophets having been laid and complete. And this seems to have been right around the end of the first century after Christ. So am I saying that the spiritual gift, the miraculous spiritual gifts ended at the end of the first century? Yeah, yeah, I yeah. am. I'm, I'm, I'm going out on a limb and saying that, pretty much. I'm not saying that God wouldn't have some, sometime later given some of those in special circumstances. Maybe if you're in a third world country and all of a sudden you can't understand Swahili, and Swahili, Swahili people cannot understand you, and you stand up and God could give you a gift of, of, of tongues for that special purpose. But by and large, I believe that they ended back then. And a whole lot more on that later. In this study of gifts, I will be emphasizing the gifts that are available to us. But today's message, I want to try to help our understanding of why or how the sign gifts are in fact not here with us anymore. 
Well, what are the sign gifts? Okay, from that list that I put up there later, there are two categories of sign gifts. It's put into two basic categories. There are revelatory gifts and there are confirmatory gifts. The first one is revelatory. The first five gifts which helped start the church growing were gifts that provided revelation of previously unrevealed truths and an accompanying ability to communicate those truths in inspired messages. So the, the first five sign gifts were there to reveal truths that had not previously been revealed. Reveal truths that our Holy Spirit inspired to reveal those truths to the people that were there. That is what they are there for, to help reveal things that only the Holy Spirit could reveal. And then once, what happened once the canon of Scripture was complete, as in the book of Revelation was written, and then God says, okay, I don't need revelatory gifts anymore. The, the full truth has been revealed. More on that. The second category of signed gifts is confirmatory gifts, basically confirming the person who is using those gifts as being a servant of God. They're basically, in the early church, if Paul could do a miracle, if Peter could do a miracle, if he could lay hands on someone and, and, and they were healed, you laid their hands on him and they were healed, that confirmed that servant of God as being from God. It was a confirmatory gift. If I could speak in tongues, for, for instance, when Peter went to speak to the, the, uh, the Gentiles on his first visit to the Gentiles and got into Cornelius' house, they started speaking in tongues. And that was a confirmation that, in fact, God was working in this situation. It was a confirmatory gift. And that's why speaking in tongues is a confirmatory gift. Okay, what are the signs? We're going to go over them, and not, not at any length, but what are those gifts? The gift of apostleship is listed in the various gifts. As you look at different apostles, the gift of apostleship, is that around anymore? No, it's not. The apostleship, the gift of apostleship is no longer here. You had to have, have actually uh, physically been there and you had to have been involved to be an apostle. And the gift of apostleship is no longer being handed out. Contrary to some of our Pentecostal or whatever people you want to call them, they call some of them, they call themselves apostles. That tells me right up front that they are false apostles. The gift of apostleship is no longer there. The gift of prophecy. Now, this is debatable, and I'm not going to come down hard on it, but the prophecy that I believe he's referring to here is actually foretelling, foretelling truth. Gift of prophecy is actually, uh, it's a revelatory gift, and they had insight insight into the mysteries of God as did the apostles. The gift of prophecy was actually being able to speak truth that comes right from the spirit of God and it was not something that was out there. And I'm telling you, I, I looked at a book this past week that was given to me by folks here and I saw the, 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 the bio at the back of the book of the, one of the authors and he said he's a prophet. I said, right away, I don't even want this book. I did read it. I did read it, David. Okay, I did it out of duty. But I, it, I, that tells me, if somebody says, I, I am a prophet, I am a modern-day prophet, I, I got problems with you. Because the prophecy that's referring to here is actually being able to give hidden truths and bring out those hidden truths. Let me read for you a scripture. Revelation. 22, verse 18. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If you add prophecy to what already is in the scripture, 
if you're not quoting scripture or if you're not enlarging on scripture, I got a problem with that. And so does God. The completed canon of the New Testament is God's completed revelation for the body of Christ. No more direct revelation for the church has or will come subsequent to that time. Anyone sharing a word of wisdom or knowledge with you today must share from the scriptures. Based on the scriptures, not some new revelation that they supposedly got from the Holy Spirit. Thirdly, distinguishing of spirits. We don't really see that used in, in the Bible, but it is a gift and was probably used. And once again, once the canon of Scripture was complete, that no longer was used. The word of wisdom or the word of knowledge, in the sense that it's used here as a gift, um, it was given directly from the Holy Spirit. It was not related to the Bible. Um, that, that gift also passed away. Someone comes up to you and says, I have a word of wisdom for you. I don't have a problem with that. It better be based on the Bible. It better be in line with the Bible. It better not be some new truth that is really revealed only to him or her and that we're not going to use that. The confirmatory spirit sign gifts, the gift of faith. This is one that's a little hard to understand. The gift of faith here is not salvation. Faith that brings salvation, that was not a special gift. That's a gift. Faith for salvation has to be in every one of us. But there was a faith that was given out as a spiritual gift after salvation that is, in fact, was very special in nature. And it was the faith that I could walk up to Tom here. He's got an ailment. And I have faith that I could lay my hand on him and he would be healed. I don't have that faith. I don't think that faith, that gift of faith is being given out anymore. I, I'm not saying it's not at all, but I, I would say that certainly very, very, very minor that that is happening. The gift of miracles and healings. Anybody here have a gift of miracles and healings? It would be those that say that they have that in, in, in the uh, charismatic movement, in the Pentecostal movement. They have, in fact, the gift of, of miracles. Do miracles happen? Yes, I have mentioned that earlier. They do happen. And the Bible specifically talks about the prayer of faith saving the sick. And basically going out there and praying for someone. I have an ailment. I call for the elders of the church, according to James 5, and they pray on me, and they anoint me with oil, and the prayer of faith can save the sick. Yes, that happens. But do I have a gift of miracles that I can just go out there and, and do that? I, I'd say no. Uh, I'd say no. Um, there's a verse for earlier in 1 Corinthians 13. If I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. That's the kind of faith, that's the kind of healing that I think is being referred to here. I have a thought-provoking idea to share with you. Did Jesus go around healing people so that the country would be less sick? No. He didn't do a very good job if that's the case. Miracles were not there so much for the benefit of the person receiving the healing, although that was part of it. Yes, Jesus did have compassion on the, on the multitudes. He did have compassion on the sick, and he healed them. He did have compassion, but the focus of the purpose of those miracles in the life of Christ and in the life of the Apostle Paul and the life of Peter, the purpose of miracles was what? It was to confirm that these were God, this God was working through these people. And that's the reason miracles and healings and also were so present in the first century is to confirm these servants as servants of God, to show that this is something special going on. 
And I think that once that period of time passed away, um, the gift of miracles passed away as well. I got to share with you just a little reading from a book that I read. There's an interesting book entitled Healing. I, 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 did I read the quote of the book? I don't remember. Healing a Doctor in Search of a Miracle by William, William Noland, who is an MD, and he's not a Christian, writing from a very objective viewpoint. Dr. Noland writes of a healing event that he attended in his research of miracle healings. Finally, it was over. There were still long lines of people waiting to get onto the stage and, cl and claim their cures. But at 5 o'clock, with a hymnal, hymn and a final blessing, the show ended. Miss Kuhlman, the faith healer, left the stage and the audience left the auditorium. Before going back to talk to Miss Kuhlman, I spent a few minutes watching the wheelchair patients leave. All the desperately ill patients who had been in wheelchairs were still in wheelchairs. In fact, the man with the kidney cancer in his spine, the man who had helped to the auditorium and who had his borrowed wheelchair brought to the stage and shown to, for the audience when he had claimed a cure, was back in the wheelchair. His cure, even if only a hysterical one, had been extremely short-lived. As I stood in the corridor watching the hopeless cases leave, seeing tears of the parents as they pushed their crippled children into the elevators, I wished Miss Kuhlman had been with me. She had complained a couple of times during the service of the responsibility, the enormous responsibility, and of how her heart, heart aches for those who weren't cured, but I wondered how often she had really looked at them. Dr. Nolan investigated 80 claims of healing performed by this Miss Kuhlman. Not one, not one was actually healed. What Dr. Nolan writes about resonates with me in my experience with my brother Noah. And it makes me angry, actually, at these people. Do miraculous healings take place? Yes, they do. I'm not going to start claiming that God doesn't do miracles. He does miracles. Do these healers today who hold these charismatic services have the gift of healing? No, they don't. I don't think they do. They, I, I, I can't say that without exception, but I, I would say they don't. The Corinthian church had all kinds of issues with this miraculous stuff, especially with the gift of tongues and interpretation of tongues. How many of you have ever heard someone speaking in tongues? It was a, it was a whole lot more prevalent down there where I grew up in Belize. Uh, the Pentecostal movement was strong there, and some of you have heard of it, um, speaking in tongues. Um, and the interpretation of tongues, they are sign gifts. The Bible prophesies in 1 Corinthians, in Isaiah 28, for by people of strange lips and with a foreign tongue, the Lord will speak to this people. And it happened during the first century. Through tongues of actual languages, God spoke to people and it was a sign it was a sign gift that God was working. And it was, it was a gift there at Pentecost so that people could hear the message of salvation. And my belief is that the gift would cease when the sign was no longer necessary. The modern charismatics are not speaking a foreign language by and large. And the supposed interpreters will admit that they have no idea what is being said that they are interpreting. Given a recorded tongues message, five different interpreters come up with five different interpretations. So does the gift of interpretation exist? I would say no, right along with the gift of tongues. Is this a negative message? I'm sorry. It sounds like a negative. I don't like doing negative messages. 
I don't like it at all. I like to give hope. And I hope I can end this message with, with some more positive words. But I, I'm, look, I'm talking about the sign gifts, and I'm talking about, I believe, the, the abuse of them. Biblical arguments for cessationism. The unique role of miracles. Why do I believe, along with many, many of you, I hope, and many, many other churches believe that the sign gifts no longer exist, is, number one, the unique role of miracles. There were three primary periods in the Bible times when God used miracles as signs. The first was with Moses. The second one was during the ministries of Elijah and Elisha. And the third was with Christ and his apostles. And during that time, God gave the sign of miracles so that the, the servants would be affirmed, that they would be affirmed as being from God. And this continues to be the purpose of miracles, not healing primarily, or the gift of miracles, I should say. Number two, the foundational nature of the New Testament apostles and prophets. Once the foundation was laid, the sign gifts were no longer necessary. They were temporary gifts, is my understanding and my belief. Thirdly, the nature of the New Testament miraculous gifts. The speaking in tongues, the gift of prophecy. They are there uh, for a purpose. That they were there for a purpose, and that purpose was fulfilled once the New Testament era was completed. Number four, the testimony of church history. So if the sign, gates, sign gifts are still present throughout history, why did they stop after the first century? And only later, much later in the 1800s and 1900s, all of a sudden get re resurrected. Why would that be? Were these people no, not believers? Yes, they were. They started going down even during the apostolic era, you see the miraculous gifts going down and down. Finally, the sufficiency of Scripture. Scripture is complete, as we saw from the book of Revelation. Scripture is complete and no longer needs these sign gifts. Okay, the practical part of the message then today. A word for us today. Be aware... Be aware of the Holy Spirit's working and providing gifts for the church. Be aware of the purpose of the sign gifts and on the gifts for today. And I'm hoping that next Sunday we will speak of the, the gifts that we really need to be focusing on, the speaking gifts, and then later on the service gifts. We should focus on personal sanctification and the work of the Spirit in producing fruit in our lives and making us more like Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit is, is more important than the, than the miraculous uh, gifts that some folks would claim. Number two, avoid sensationalism. Um, the Holy Spirit is at work in the church today, convicting men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit is there developing fruit in the lives of believers and drawing people to Christ. It's up there lifting up Christ and bringing honor to him. He's not involved with knocking people down and causing them to laugh in funny ways. That's not the work of the Spirit today. It is there to, to build up the church. It's there to build up believers. There's something else causing that other. I'm not sure what it is. Word for us today is live in harmony with the word. Don't go around with new revelations. The canon of scripture is complete. After the death of John the Revelator, there is no prophecy happening. We expound the word. The spirit illuminates the word for us. There is no new word. Number four, and perhaps the most important, leading into the rest of the discussion of the, 
gifts of the Spirit. Use your gifts to build the body. We're going to be talking about next Sunday and later on the gifts that are there to build up the body of Christ. And as we mentioned earlier, each one of you, if you're a Christian, have been given at least one gift. Some of you, multiple gifts. We are to use those gifts to build up the body. They're not there for sensation. They're not there. They're often done in a, in a quiet, private way. They're there to draw attention to God, not people. They're there to, to build up the body, and that is what these gifts are for. The speaking gifts, we're going to look at evangelism and pastoring and teaching and exhortation. The serving gifts, serving in all kinds of ways, giving, administration, and showing mercy. And we want to highlight those gifts in the coming messages. God bless you. And I hope that you're not going away all depressed, but hopefully you go away with a better understanding of what happened to the sign gifts. God bless you and call for a song.